Well, good morning and welcome to Catalina Foothills Church. My name is John Stone and I am the head pastor here. And on behalf of our session, our deacons and our staff want to welcome you to worship. It's an honor and privilege to host you in worship. And we thank you for coming and being with, with us today. We hope that as you come in to worship that we can bring you into the presence of Jesus Christ. We come to worship him. We come to give ourselves to him. So we hope that you'll meet him today. For this uh, fall, we're actually studying the hard sayings of Jesus, and today we're looking at some at the, in Luke that are really, uh, really challenge us around our relationships both to our culture and to our family. And our quote in the bulletin says, no love of the natural heart is safe unless the human heart has been satisfied by God first. So I hope today as you come in, we can meet Christ, and he can become first, and then you can rest in him. We hope that our worship will lead you to a place of rest in your soul and in your person as you lean into who Christ is for you. We hope also that today will remind you of God's great love for you and his call for you to love him back. And we hope if you rest in Christ and are reminded of Christ, then we will go out and reflect the gospel wherever we go, here in our worship and in our neighborhood and to the ends of the earth as we go through Tucson. So welcome to worship we're glad you're here. Let's just take a few moments of silence and prepare for worship. Amen. Would you stand with me for the call to worship, which comes from Psalm 33. Sing joyfully to the Lord, you righteous. It is fitting for the upright to praise him. Sing to him a new song. Play skillfully and shout for joy. For the word of the Lord is right and true. He is faithful in all he does. The Lord loves righteousness and justice. The earth is full of his unfailing love. Come, let us worship the Lord together. Would you pray with me? Lord Jesus, we come to give ourselves to you. We want to bring everything we are and, and give all of it to you. We come with hopes and we come with fears, we come with wounds, we come having been healed, we come needing to be healed, we come with doubts and with faith, we come from all sorts of places. But indeed, Jesus, we've come to you to bow down before you because you are our creator and you are our redeemer. You are our only hope in this life and in the next for salvation. So open our eyes and our hearts and give us energy to worship, um, hear our prayers, um, answer our doubts, feed our faith as we gather around your word and one another. And Lord, be glorified in this. And we ask this for your name's sake. Amen. Sing together. Before I spoke a word. Before I spoke a word, you were singing all for me. You have been so, so good to me. Before I took a breath, you breathed your life in me. You have been so, so kind. To me and all oh, the overwhelming, never ending, reckless love of God. Oh, it chases me down, fights till I'm found, leaves the 99. I didn't earn it, I don't deserve it. So you give yourself away. You 
Say that you're my God. 
Sorry, let's be seated for our confession of sin. Here I am to say that you are my God. We come to him because he's the one who cleanses, restores, forgives, gives us our identity. Here we are to say that he is our God. And so we will confess our sins to him first aloud together and corporately, and then you'll have space and time for your silent and personal confession of sin. We do this answering the question, Christian, what is your confession of sin? Father, we come before you as your people battling and sometimes losing to sin. Many of us come today wearied and exhausted. Would you bring new life and renewed strength for the journey that is our life? Please bring new love where we have turned hard-hearted Bring a willingness to forgive those who have sinned against us and caused us great pain. Bring the joy and freedom of the Holy Spirit, setting us free from the chains of sinful habits. Give us new resurrected hearts to know you, serve you, and love you today and tomorrow and every day that follows. May the glorious truth of the cross fuel our lives And may the truth of the resurrection give us hope for tomorrow as we live for your glory today. Amen. Offer your silent and personal confession to God. In the name of our shepherd, king, and friend, the Lord Jesus, amen. Christians, lift up your heads and hear these words from God's word about the compassion and forgiveness that we have in our brother Jesus. For I will forgive their wickedness and will remember their sins no more. You are forgiven, really forgiven. You know, we said, here we are to say that you're my God. You need to hear the Lord saying to you, here I am to say that you are my child. That's who we are and that's who he is for us. And so with great confidence in that love, let's stand and sing these songs of thanks. Like a river, a ten. 
wendeth my way And when sorrows like sea billows roll Whatever my Lord Thou hast taught me to say It is well, it is well with my soul Satan should buffet. Though Satan should buffet, though trials should come, let this blessed assurance control that Christ has regarded my helpless estate and has shed his own. Sweetest frame 
confession of faith. On Christ, the solid rock I stand, and you say, all other ground is sinking sand. What a confession of faith right there, Christians. I mean, it takes belief to even sing that. So, Christians, what is it that you believe? For those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. The Spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. 
Rather, the spirit you receive brought about your adoption to sonship, and by him we cry, Abba, Father. The spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now, if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. If indeed we share in his sufferings, in order that we may also share in his glory. Amen. You may be seated. Let's pray together. Almighty God, Father of all mercies, we, your beloved children, give you humble thanks for all your goodness and loving kindness to us and to all whom you've made. We bless you, O Lord, for our creation, preservation, and all the blessings of this life. But above all, we bless you for your immeasurable love in the redemption of the world by our Lord Jesus Christ. We bless you for the hope of glory, for the means of grace. And we ask that you would so work in us to give us an awareness of your mercy so that with truly thankful hearts, we may show forth your praise, not only with our lips, but with our very lives by giving up ourselves to your service and to that of our neighbor and by walking with you in joyful holiness and righteousness all our days. Oh God, we pray for the, the advance of your church. You who have created of one blood all the peoples of the earth and sent your son to preach peace to those who are far off and to those who are near. We ask that you would grant that everywhere people may seek after you and find you. Bring the nations to your fold. Pour out your spirit upon all flesh and hasten the coming of your kingdom. Father, you are our shepherd, a very present help in time of trouble. We thank you that you are accessible and powerful and you tell us to come to you, to cry out to you. You bend your ear to us and you hear us. Thank you. We pray this morning for the brokenhearted. Would you turn their sadness and sorrow into joy? We pray for those who are destitute, homeless, forgotten, and the persecuted. Remember them, Lord. Hear their cries. And Lord, would you lift up those who are cast down, the heavy laden, whether it be because of things outside their control or result of their own sin. Be merciful, God. You forgive. Would you give hope? And for those struggling with illness, chronic pain, awaiting treatment and test, you are the great physician. Please provide help and healing. For those in despair, would you lift their heads and provide a way out? Revive us with your gospel. You are our advocate. You are what our hearts long for. We cast our anxieties on you and rest in your infinite arms. We put our trust in you, and we wait for you. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Rob and Kim. Before we turn to our passage this week, just a few um, uh, reminders about our life here together in our church. Uh, the first one is our city service coming up on the 25th. And that'll be next Saturday, and that kickoff is at 8 a.m. here in our sanctuary, there'll be refreshments and coffee. Uh, so this is the last week. Please sign up today if you can online or there'll be people in the lobby who can also sign you up. You'll receive an email reminder. There are just a couple of places where we need more volunteers so that we don't have to cancel uh, helping someone. The first one is the Assistance League of Tucson. We need at least 10 more people to sign up to organize donations for their thrift store. Now, you may think that's not that hard, but their proceeds from the store go to provide things like school supplies and backpacks for kids, household goods for people starting their lives over, or women and children who've been abused and assaulted. It's really a beautiful ministry, and they just need help, so consider signing up for that one. Now, if you, and this is okay, if you um, got a bad hip, bad knee, and you can't move, and you're not sure you can paint, and you don't have that kind of energy, that's okay, because I have the thing for you. If you are over 18 and vaccinated, 
you can play bingo in the name of Jesus. And I mean this. The Sapphire Nursing Home, these residents have made it through COVID and lockdowns, and they've been very alone. And they're really excited to have some people come and visit them, and their favorite activity is bingo. So they're asking, will you send some Christians to play bingo with us? And I'm sure you can do this. You can even lose at it. So would you consider... If you're of the right age and been vaccinated doing that, they would just love to have you. And finally, the house of prayer. One very devoted Christian woman runs a small 10-bed assisted living facility in South Tucson, which is essentially a tiny house that needs some TLC. If you can offer some elbow grease and minor repair and sprucing skills, she would really appreciate it. This is a sister in Christ who needs us. Y'all have done well. We've got over 180 people signed up, which makes your pastor's heart happy and Jesus' heart even happier. But if you haven't signed up, because you're from Tucson and you wait till the last minute to do everything for some reason, these would be good ones for you to sign up for and we'd appreciate it. And finally, our def- uh, the, this Wednesday night, instead of regular youth group, they're going to go trampolining at Defy Trampoline. It's just $20, grades 6 through 12. If your child or nephew or niece has never come, there, this would be a great time for them to jump in. Uh, you can get in touch with Chris um, or you can sign up through the footprint but would love to have them jump in that's this Wednesday night $20 and that includes dinner and also some of you have asked we always are now providing questions from the sermons for small groups and they're back there near the offering plates as they're out so you can grab those questions about the message we're doing today so we are um, looking at the hard sayings of Jesus this fall And we come now to Luke 9 and some hard sayings that are at the end of Luke 9. And really what's going on in the the way Luke is writing this is that Luke writes chapters 8 and 9 together as one story. Now obviously we have verses and chapter dividers, but often they get in the way. They're helpful for finding where to go look, but it's one story. And Jesus is really driving home this idea really strongly that following him cost us something. And he's being very clear to those who are listening to him that he's going to die, but they're struggling to hear him. Uh, at one point in the text, we'll see it, it says he spoke plainly about this. And so this hard saying, there's actually three of them, they're really... Um, There are these snippets that Luke is pulling out from the previous probably three or four weeks to highlight the different dilemmas that the people following Jesus are having. So I want us to enter into these three questions and see if we might not have the same dilemma that his original listeners had. Luke 9, verse 57, as they were walking along the road, a man said to Jesus, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus replied, foxes have dens and birds have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. And Jesus said to another man, hey, you, follow me. But he replied, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. Jesus said to him, let the dead bury their own dead, but you go and proclaim the kingdom of God. So another said, I will follow you, Lord, but first let me go back and say goodbye to my family. And Jesus replied, no one who puts a hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the service in the kingdom of God. Amen. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of God stands forever. Let's pray and ask God to teach us his word. Lord, open our eyes now um, to your word and let the Holy Spirit be our teacher about what you meant here and, and how it teaches us as Christians today to walk with you. And we pray this for your name's sake. Amen. Growing up in South Carolina, there was a school called the Citadel located in Charleston, South Carolina. It's a military school. Now, it's not the same as like service academies because if you go to a service academy, you're actually going to go into the Navy, the Air Force, or the Army. Uh, Places like the Citadel or VMI, you can go, you're in the Corps, it's actually a military school, but at the end, you have opportunity to say, that was great, I'm going to go and do something different. You don't have to go into a service. And so... um, Every year from my high school, several people would choose to go to the Citadel. But the year I graduated, there were two young men who went there. Now, the first one, it's interesting, he wanted to go directly from high school into the Army. His dad had served in the Army and had had a long and distinguished career in the Army, was very proud of it, and would 
probably have loved his son to go in the army, but he wasn't sure the army was for his son. But his son said, I don't need college. I'm going to go in. It's going to be my career. But his dad said, hey, I'm not sure. Let me pay for you to go to the Citadel. You'll get the experience. You'll get basic training, all the same things. And you might not like it at the end. You've, you've got a degree. You've had that experience. You can go on. And the kid, the, my friend decided to do it. Now I had another friend, and we don't want this. We hope this is not our child, but he had quite a senior year. Spectacular in all the wrong ways. Several, several brush, brushes with the law, a felony, um, a drug scandal, you know. But he did graduate, and he walked. And after he walked, much to the great relief of his parents that he walked, his dad met him after graduation and said, Today you have two choices. I love you. You can go to the Citadel or you can move out, but I'm not paying for you anymore. These are your two options. And like any good rebel, he screamed and yelled and said, I'm never doing it. And then he went out to try to rent an apartment, get a car, get a job, and decided maybe the Citadel was for him after all. <laughs> and so he went to the Citadel. The Citadel is a beautiful place. It's a, they do beautiful things your first year. You have to run in the gutter even when it's raining. <clears throat> you cannot look seniors in the eye. You must address them as, yes, sir. And it's a great place. So these, four guys, these two guys actually went <coughs> for four years and graduated on the same day. And on the day they graduated, they made really different choices. That original one who was sure he wanted to go in the Army, that was his only call, graduated and is very thankful for his time at the Citadel and decided that there was no armed service for him. He was done. That had been a great experience. And he's gone on to have a really marvelous career and a family and loves it. But interestingly enough, and not surprisingly, because I'm telling the story, the other gentleman thought, this is the greatest thing I've ever found. Went on to serve 30 years in the service and got to an incredibly high rank and had an incredibly great career. And he just thought, this was me. It's interesting, the guy who thought he wanted to do it and didn't said, you know what, that was really helpful because my dad made me count the cost. I really didn't know what it was. I saw who my dad was. I saw how people thought about my dad. I saw the way they respected my dad. I loved the community my dad was in, but I didn't really know what it meant to go from the beginning to the end, and my dad helped me count the cost. So Jesus is doing this very same thing for the disciples who are following him. He's trying to get them to count the cost, to understand what it really means to be his disciples. And through these two chapters, as we lead up to these three questions, he's showing them the beauty of his kingdom. He's healing people. He's feeding people. But he's constantly saying this over and over. If you would come after me, you have to take up your cross and follow me. And they're having a hard time hearing that. They're having a hard time embracing that. And so Luke decides to summarize this dilemma they're having with hearing him in these three questions. Now, the reason I know, by the way, they're having a hard time hearing him is that Jesus says twice in these two chapters, I'm going to go to Jerusalem. They will actually arrest me. They'll beat me, and they'll put me on a cross, and they'll kill me. And yet, the second time he does that, the disciples begin to argue about who will be the greatest when he sits on his throne. They're not hearing it. They're not able to hear it. So I hope this morning that we can hear it unlike these disciples. And here's what I'd like us to hear. Where Jesus is going, what Jesus is asking, and who do you love? Where Jesus is going, what Jesus is asking, and who do you love? Now the first question here that is a summation is a story that Luke would have seen where a, a gentleman came up to Jesus and said, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said, foxes have dens, birds have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. Now, the key to this question is, he says, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus says, I don't have anywhere to go. Right? He says, foxes have dens, birds have nests. But the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. Now, we understand from a modern perspective, I don't mean as modern people, but those who have the, sort of the, the whole New Testament, that in some sense Jesus recognizes that he's headed to be with his Father. He has turned his face to Jerusalem, and he's staunchly going there to die, that he might then be both resurrected and then ascend 
But what he's saying to the disciples is, if you follow me, you will have no place. What Jesus is saying is that I am going to the cross. And to be my disciple, I want you to not only have a cross in you, but have a cross on you. You too, he would say, must take up your cross and follow me daily. Jesus, in so many different ways, is shooting at our hearts and saying that the things you long for, the comforts of this world, will be given up in the pursuit of me. They'll be given up as you follow me. It's interesting, he makes a veiled reference even here to politics when he says, foxes have dens and birds have nests. These were essentially the names of the two political parties of the day. And he's saying, if you follow the leaders of this world, they will make a place for you. But it won't be a place with me. If you follow me, I'm going to a cross, and the following of me cannot be avoided. You will have to go through the cross to have me. This man probably, and, and there's some reason to think this, had seen the spectacular, miraculous works of of Christ and the feeding of the people and the healing of the countryside and he wanted that and Jesus is saying yes that's part of my kingdom but where I'm going is to a cross you will have to deny yourself and follow me your comforts will be destroyed in joining me in this endeavor this is the way he says it. Let's quote it. Jesus strictly warned them not to tell this to anyone, not to tell what, that he was the Christ. He, Peter just said, you're the Christ. And Jesus said, don't tell anybody this. He said, the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and chief priests and teachers of the law, and he must be killed and on the third day rise again. And then he said to them, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny himself, take up their cross daily, and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life, they'll lose it. But whoever loses their life for me will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world and yet forfeit their very soul? Whoever is ashamed of me and my words, the Son of Man will be ashamed of them when he comes in his glory and in the glory of the Father and of the holy angels. Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up their cross daily, and follow me. It's probable that the first man wanted to follow Jesus because of what he could get out of it. Not for the value of Jesus himself. And Jesus says, do you want to follow me wherever I go? I'm going to a cross to die. Join me. When Marissa and I lived in Knoxville, Tennessee, and this is probably 20 years ago, we would travel to get to the Carolinas from Knoxville. We would go from Knoxville and Interstate 40 over to Asheville and then Interstate 26 down into the Carolinas, or 40 into North Carolina. And Interstate 40, as it went from Knoxville to Asheville, was one of those mountain roads. It was a four-lane interstate, but it got so narrow in those mountains that it was only the concrete barrier in the middle, and they had to squeeze it. And you're on the side of a mountain, right? They've built this interstate in some amazing way, right? On, and you're, you know, you're turning around each hill, and it's just, it's just harrowing and tight. You didn't want to drive it at night or when it's raining, right? But it was an interstate, and it took you about four, four and a half hours to get to my home. One spring, it rained. Um, there were record, you know, those hundred-year rains. It rained that much in Knoxville, and it caused a rock slide in the mountains, and it totally caved out Interstate 40. Not just one lane, two lanes, but all four. It washed out the side of a mountain. And I don't remember exactly. I think it took them about two years to rebuild that interstate. But what that meant was there was no way to get in any helpful or quick way to the Carolinas. What you had to do is drive over to a place called Newport, Tennessee, and then jump on a two-lane road that was never designed for interstate traffic and do that back roads way. And I'm sure if you had time and energy, it was beautiful, but when you're trying to get to the Carolinas in four hours, this became at best, at best, a seven-hour trip. But more than that, every truck had to take it. And bus... And so when you got on the road, it was something like 49 miles, and it was three hours. But there's going to be a wreck. A truck hits another truck, somebody spins out, and then you're just sitting there. There's no other way. This is the way. And you're just sitting there. 
and you're just sitting there. I know somebody took them 18 hours. That changed the way we thought about going to see my family. I love my mom and dad and my brother, but you need to be doing something important for me to get on that road and come see you. My brother and I would, before that, quite often just meet in Asheville. Very easy trip, two hours from me, about three hours from him, play golf. No more. You had to decide this. Is this worth it because if I'm going to go over to Newport and get on that road this needs to be better than Thanksgiving I mean Christmas yes Thanksgiving I'm not sure about Thanksgiving for some dried out turkey bad ham and a casserole my dad likes but we don't like I'm not sure that trip was worth that it needs to be 10 days or two weeks I love them but we're not dashing over to see you anymore Jesus is asking you to count the cost of following him. It's harder than a two-lane road of almost 50 miles it takes forever. It's a cross. This man is naive. He wants to follow Jesus to have food and miracles. And Jesus says, that's great. You want to follow me wherever I go? I have no place. My place is a cross. Look, this is the appropriate time to use the Jim Elliott quote, is it not? He is no fool who gives up what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. Jesus is saying, where are you trying to lay your head? I don't have a place. My place is the cross. And I'm going through the cross and my disciples will follow me. To go with Jesus is to bear a cross. But there's a second question here that's asked that is, builds on the first question and is actually a bit more confusing for us. So let's look at it. Because the first guy seems a bit naive. I'll follow you wherever you go. And Jesus is like, whoa, 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 let me tell you where I'm going. The second person seems to ask a very legitimate question, right? And Jesus actually sought this second person out. And, and Jesus went to them in verse uh, 59 and said, follow me. And he said, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. Now, the way a Middle Eastern person in that day and age hears this phrase is different than the way any of you hear this phrase. I just want to be crystal clear. You're allowed to go to your father's funeral. Christianity would encourage that. That's not what's being said here. So let me quote, rather, in an unusual for me, in a rather lengthy way from a guy named Kenneth Bailey. Kenneth Bailey taught forever as a Christian in the Middle East and was an expert on the way the faith worked out in the time of Jesus. And here's what he says about this quote. In the Middle East, the phrase, allow me to bury my father, is a common term. The oldest son is expected to live with his parents and care for them until they pass. Any indication to leave or not to live up to this obligation results in the phrase, Will you not stay to bury your father? That phrase is full of shame, can lead you to being fired from your job or driven out of your village. This is a cultural obligation. It's not that the man's father had just died and the man must attend to funeral arrangements. In that case, he would, not have, he, would, he would have been at home and not with Jesus. He wouldn't be out asking this question. The man is concerned about cultural obligations that have been created where he lives. Once his father has gone, then he would join Jesus. When Jesus and yet when Jesus calls us into his service, he calls for an immediate response. He calls us to put him above cultural obligations. His call is demanding, to be sure. It requires personal sacrifice. Being willing to sacrifice family obligations, or more importantly, in this case, cultural obligations, may be the hardest sacrifice to make of all. Saying goodbye in the Middle East means asking for permission. Let me go first and make arrangements to my home is a term they use now. Or let me go and arrange for my possessions at home. It's an indication that the person must seek permission from someone else, from their culture to follow Jesus. And Jesus is clearly saying, 
what your culture is asking of you is wrong, you follow me and ignore that. This is probably an older son, right, from that culture. And people from the Middle East and the Far East will feel this much more strongly than we will, although we certainly all feel the need to care for our parents. The scriptures are clear that those who are in Christ care for their parents. But what Christ is saying is that this cultural expectation laid on you must be laid aside and you must follow me now. You will not be able to please your culture and follow me. The two will have to be divided. I don't mean by this that we will never succeed in any of our careers or we can never go to university and get degrees, but it will be increasingly hard for Christians to stand in the marketplace and to please their bosses and those around them and to follow the commands of Christ. That's just where we are. And we can bemoan it, we can complain about it, or we can just admit it. This is actually hard to illustrate. It is. Because it's it's easy for you to think, well, I don't see this, but you're going to feel it. You're going to feel your culture saying, you must do this and you must be this to be a good person. When in fact Christ is asking you to do something different. Not the opposite, but different. And I will say this, and I say this hoping that all of your children graduate with honors with three PhDs. That the closer you get to university life, and the closer you get to governmental life, the more you'll feel this. It's just a fact. That's where we are. The culture is expecting us to be one thing when Christ is asking us to do it. And here's what, here's what this guy is saying. Like, let's, let's name it. Jesus, certainly you don't want me to ruin my reputation in the community to follow you. You want me to keep those relationships with those friends so that having followed you in a few years, I can now bring them. And Jesus says, no, I want you to follow me now. I want you to let the dead bury their dead. I had an employee for a while. I mean, I had an employee back in the day, not for a while. He worked till he finished. And we'd hired this gentleman just out of college, great employee, worked for our ministry. And as we got going with his job, he was doing really well. And one day he just mentioned to me, hey, my dad is uncomfortable with me doing this part of the job. And I just said, okay, I don't care. Uh, you graduated college, you took a job, this is the job, go in peace. So his dad called me and uh, was really good. It wasn't just like confrontational conversation and said, hey, I'm really uncomfortable with my son having to do this. I mean, I was really confused. I was standing in my front yard in Knoxville, I know right where I was standing, and I was like, okay, you're uncomfortable. Like, no, I'm going to forbid him from doing it. I said, gotcha. No problem. Two thumbs up. It's this easy. Your son obeys you and I fire him or he obeys me and he keeps his job. Have a good evening. (laughs) Click. No, it wasn't hard. hard. What we were asking him to do was moral, right, and good. And the father didn't like it. I don't don't know why. Now, I'm still really good friends with that family, believe it or not. Really good friends. But it wasn't hard. You want him not to do it. Let me check. I'm the boss. I want him to do it. Have a good evening. Click. He's a college graduate, by the way, friends. This is not an eighth grader I'm doing this to. (laughs) This is sort of easy to understand. The guy's like, Jesus, you seem to be the deal, but i got to go make the culture happy. So give me like six or eight years. And Jesus says, no, no, this is easy. You can do it and go to hell, or you can follow me through the cross and go to heaven. That's it. No, that's what he says. That's what Jesus says, not John Stone. It's easy. Yeah, go bury him, and you and I won't know each other, or follow me. But you can't go do that and be my disciple. I mean, Jesus is claiming an authority over our lives that makes all of us uncomfortable. All of us. 
I don't care how long you've been in Christ or how much you want to walk with Christ. This kind of authority that he's claiming makes us uncomfortable. Because he's saying, I make decisions for you. Which brings me to the last one of these three hard things. He, uh, still another said, I will follow you, Lord. First, let me go back and say goodbye to my family. And Jesus replied, no one who puts a hand to the plow and looks back is fit for service in the kingdom of God. Now, this one is what you think it is, but I'm going to say it in a hopefully more gentle, funny way. This is what he says. I'll follow you, Lord, but first let me go back and check with mom. That's what he says. And Jesus says, you can't go ask your mom about this one. Implied or your dad. You have to do what I say over what your parents say. I'm a more important authority than your parents. But what's being gotten at here, just, and, and those listening would have heard this, the middle one is about cultural obligation and fear of man. This one is about your loves. Who do you love? I just want to make sure, Jesus, I want you, that my mom and dad, the people that raised me, the people that I owe my life to, I just want to make sure they're okay with it. And Jesus says, I don't care if they're okay with it. We're going to look at a harder saying later. It'll be almost a little bit of a repeat of the sermon where he, Jesus says, I, I didn't come to make peace in families. I came to divide moms and daughters, dads and sons. That's, I actually came to divide them. And he's saying, if you want to go back and get to permission of your family, you don't know what it means to take up a cross and follow me and go with me. That's what he's saying. No one who puts their hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the sing service in the kingdom of, of God. Who do you love? He's asking you, in a really gentle way, don't you love me more than your mother? Don't you love me more than your children? And don't you love me more than your spouse? Now, how can he say it? I mean, moms, they're the best. They make you milkshakes when you have a fever. They sort of believe you when you're sick. They get you out of school early. Dads, they make you suffer. But moms, can't we go talk to them and he says, quite simply, this is about who do you love. If you've seen me for who I am, you will love me more than your parents. You will love me more than your children. And the healthiest thing that parents and children ever say to one another is, I love you, and you can always move home and I'll die for you, but don't ever make this mistake. I love Jesus more than you. And what I think what would surprise you if, if you worked in campus ministry as long as I did is how often Christian parents prevent their children from following Jesus. I mean this very seriously. And I'll use small examples. Like often we would invite college kids to go on a mission trip for spring break or to go and do a mission project in the summer. They have three summers. Hey, take this summer and let's go to this country and let's serve and let's learn to follow Christ. And I can't tell you how often that the deeper and stronger a family pre pre often presented themselves as Christian, they would be like, oh, no, 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 you can't do that. You've got, you've got to build that resume this summer. You've got to get that internship. If you do that, you won't get the job that we always dreamed you would have. That's your dream too, isn't it? We just want you to be wise. Now, we love that you're in this group, but they seem a bit radical to us. These are Christians. This is y'all. This isn't the pagans, right? This is people in the house going... Like, don't, don't go too far with it. You mean as far as Jesus said? Do you love me more than your mother? Look, this one is hard. But what Jesus says is when you love me and know that I love you, that's the place you can gain your footing, your identity, and your sense of self. And it, place you can never gain it anywhere else 
what our spouse cannot give us and what our children cannot give us and what we cannot give to our children, Jesus indeed can give to us a sense of being loved and loving from a place of absolute security. We say this quite often here. The reason we confess our sins is because we can. And he didn't blink. He gave his own son. The reason Jesus can be this hard on them is because Jesus has chosen his people at the cost of his life and even in some mystical sense a a breaking in that cross of, of the perfect love he had with his father he empties himself and he can say love me above all else because he's standing there loving them above all else it's extraordinary and it's the only place where we will really be changed and where we'll really ever love anyone else So here's a story from the Bible. You think, pastor's crazy today. He got us hating on our moms. That's why we got to double down and do this one again later in the semester. So here's an interesting story in 2 Samuel about a man who had to choose between loving God and loving his spouse. And it's a somewhat familiar story, but it's amazing the way the text teaches you the story. So here's here's what happened. This is about David the king And he's decided to bring the ark back to Jerusalem. And the first time he went to bring the ark back to Jerusalem, he did not read the instructions, think your dad. And he got someone killed because he didn't know how to do it. And he left it out there in a field. And that field became so blessed by God that he decided to go read the instructions, the Bible, and figure out how to move it because it was such a powerful thing. So now he's figured out how to get it. He's doing the right stuff. And we'll jump into the middle of the story. But the way that the king of Israel dressed is they made an actual outfit for him. The whole, like Hollywood would be proud. You know, the 12 tribes of Israel are on his shoulder. Six on this shoulder, six on that. Everything was covered. It weighed probably about 120 pounds. And they had to build a big, strong, thick cotton, like undergarment to keep all that metal and gold from like, hurting the person so as they're bringing the ark back and they, they've they've sacrificed they've obeyed the scriptures it's coming in David decides to worship and to celebrate so he actually takes off his kingly garment there's nothing that would say he's a king and what David is saying this what David is saying in that moment is Jesus is coming and we're all the same There are no kings and queens. There are no men and women. We're just people before the throne. And so he's dancing, and he he intentionally chooses to dance with the poorest women among them to show that grace is the only great equalizer. And this is how the text reads. That's a whole other sermon, can you tell? Wearing a linen ephod, David was dancing before the Lord with all his might, while he and all Israel were bringing up the ark of the Lord with shouts and the sound of trumpets. As the ark of the Lord was entering the city of David, Michael, daughter of Saul. Now, this is actually David's wife, but the text is now teaching you something. So, Micah, the daughter of Saul, the first wife of David, watched from a window, and when she saw King David leaping and dancing before the Lord, she despised him in her heart. Interesting. Interesting. They brought the ark of the Lord and set it in its place inside the tent that David had pitched for it. And David sacrificed burnt offerings in accordance with the scriptures and fellowship offerings in accordance with the scriptures before the Lord. And he finished sacrificing the burnt offerings and fellowship offerings. He blessed the people in the name of the Lord Almighty. This is probably, um, it's probably 30, 50,000 people. Then he gave a loaf of bread a cake of dates and a cake of raisins to each person in the whole crowd of the delights, both men and women. The grace of Christ has come. There's no distinction. And all the people went to their homes having been blessed, having been worshipped. The thing is here. And then David got to go home. When David returned home to bless his household, Michael, daughter of Saul, first wife of David, came out to meet him and said, with honestly deep sarcasm, how the king of Israel has distinguished himself today. Going around half naked in full view of slave girls, of his servants, as any vulgar fellow would. This is what she said. She said, I didn't marry you to be common. 
I married you because you're the king and I'm the wife of a king and that gives me identity. How dare you insult your office and me as your wife by taking off those kingly garments. You became just common. What are you doing? You're embarrassing us. Sounds like a southern mom to me, right? And David said to her, It was before the Lord who chose me rather than your father or anyone from his house when he appointed me ruler over the Lord's people Israel. I will celebrate before the Lord and you'll never stop me. He loved this woman. All the other stories, here's what he said. Don't be mistaken. I love Jesus more than I love you. I'll become even more undignified than this, and I'll be humiliated in my own eyes. But by these slave girls, by the way, you spoke of, I'll be held in honor, because what I said to them, honey, is that the gospel's true. You and I, slave girls of service, these are women who are the slaves of slaves. That's about as bad as it gets. And what David said to, said to them that day is, the king has come, and we're the same. And the scripture tells us what happened. And Michael, daughter of Saul, had no children to the day of her death. It's an amazingly hard story. Because Jesus says to this last person, I just want to go home and tell my mama goodbye. And Jesus said, no one who puts a hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the service in the kingdom of God. If you haven't figured out, Christians, that I'm the most beautiful, complete person, the only one worthy of your complete love, you haven't seen me yet. You don't know me. Who do you love? Because only when you love me above all else will you really find yourself. Let me pray for us. We pray, Father, that we would all count the cost of following you as you go to the cross, as you ask us to stand against our culture, and as you ask us where our heart is. Are you our highest love, higher than our children, our family, our spouses, or whatever it is? And we thank you, Jesus, that as you spoke this, you were resolutely going to Jerusalem to demonstrate the highest love that any of us have ever experienced the love of a man who died in our place. So nourish us now at this table that celebrates that, we pray for your name's sake. Amen. This meal that we put in front of you is a meal that Jesus himself created. He took the Passover and it became the Lord's Supper in which we celebrate his death by eating of his flesh and drinking of his blood. The flesh represented in his bread, the blood represented as wine and what we're saying is that we need to as we talked about last week feed on Jesus Christ alone for our salvation so we come now as Christians to this and we celebrate and declare our faith in Jesus Christ and if today you're not a Christian we would ask that you don't eat from this meal it's not a desire to exclude you or highlight you it's because this is actually an act of faith it says I believe that Jesus died for me in my place and that he's the only God. And if that's not what you're prepared to confess today, we're thrilled you're here. But we want you to know that's what we're confessing. Because indeed we are Christians. And on the night he was betrayed, Jesus took bread and broke it and said, This is my body, which is broken for you. Eat this as often as you do so in remembrance of me. And he also took a cup that night and said, This cup represents a new covenant. It's made with my blood for the forgiveness of sins of many. Drink this as often as you do so in remembrance of me, and therefore proclaim my death until I come. Let's take a few brief moments to prepare for this meal. Amen. Christians, we break bread in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and we proclaim the great mystery of our faith. These are the gifts of God, and they're for the people of God. The body of Christ is broken for you. Eat with great joy.
blood of Christ is poured out for you. Drink with great joy. Let's sing a song together. Let's stand. God, I'm on my knees again. God, I'm begging, please begin. I need you. Oh. up and hands up. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. And may the Lord make his face shine upon you. Even the one who went to the cross to show you his love. Go in his peace. Amen.